Hi, welcome to the ITAR podcast. The uh, aim for this podcast was to bring in underappreciated people who do good work in the community. A uh, special shout out to our community partners, British Columbia Muslim Association, British Columbia Muslim Sports Association, and the Halal in Vancouver page on Facebook. With me here today is Parvez Rafiq. Parvez, thank you for joining us on our first ever episode of ITAR podcast. Thank you for having me, man. Appreciate it. My pleasure, my pleasure. How is Ramadan going for you right now? Uh, so far so good, so far so good. What are we on? Day... Five now. Day, okay, oh, five yeah. years. So far so good. Um, yeah, can't complain. What does Ramadan actually mean to you? When it comes to Ramadan, what, what does it represent for you? Ramadan, so I mean, I know a lot of people um, put a lot of emphasis on, the, the of course, the, the fasting part and the, the eating part, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, a lot of individuals will say, what? No, no food, no water, you're starving yourself, what is this all about? But they're, they're, like as you know, there's so many benefits yeah. um, and so many different aspects of Ramadan. So you have the spiritual benefits, the physical, uh, the just the mental clarity, your health, uh, your closeness with Allah, closeness with God. Um, so there's so many different aspects of, uh, of Ramadan that are there, right? No, no, that's absolutely true. Before we uh, just move on with this conversation, I think we would like to give the people who are watching this an opportunity to uh, get familiar with you. Absolutely. So just what do you do? Why are you here? And why do you do what you do? Man, uh, long, long journey. So my name is Parwaz Rafiq. Um, I am the owner of PR Fitness Studio. Um, I've been a personal trainer for about 10 years now, personal oh, trainer and strength and conditioning coach. Um, and I own a fitness studio in White Rock. Um, father of two. Um, yeah, just a young entrepreneur. Um, Fitness and health just became a really big part of my life, and I really enjoyed helping people and kind of making uh, an impact uh, on people's lives. So yeah, that's kind of why we're here. Was the uh, the fitness aspect of it the the reason you got into training and coaching mm-hmm. other people? Was it because you liked fitness or you liked coaching people, helping people more? So um, I guess growing up, very you know, very, I was very skinny, very weak, so I, I needed to do something about it. So I started going to the gym. Yeah. Uh, I didn't like it. I hated it. So I, I never didn't go back for a year. I was always into sports like soccer, boxing, and things like that. Mm. Um, but I gave it another go, the strength training, the lifting weights, and things like that. Uh, and that's when I started to really take it seriously and notice changes in my body. Mm. Um, and then once, I guess, uh, I fell in love with the, the working out and lifting and things like that, um, that's when I kind of pursued it and started coaching and teaching. So it, it wasn't something that I was always good at or it wasn't something that I always enjoyed. It's just it, the impact that it had on my life. Yeah. It was like I, need, I made that decision to now try to help others kind of get the, get yeah, the same benefits. So. How old were you when you when you talk about this, that you went for a year, then you skipped, then you came back? That was right after high school, so probably about 18, 19. Oh, so you're fairly young. Yeah. All right, yeah, okay. yeah. So all of the parents out there, it's okay to work out fairly young, right? It's there's no taboo around it. The earlier it is, in my opinion, I think the better it is. Oh, absolutely! Like uh, our youngest clients at our studio are about six, seven years old. Wow. We, have, we have a lot of teenagers, you know, fifteen, sixteen year olds. So do you think there's still a lot of education that has to be done with the parents of, let's say, forty years old or fifty years old who still think of weight training as or stunt your growth, this and that? Do you think there's still a lot of education, or we're getting yeah. better? Absolutely, I think so. I think there is that common misconception that oh, you, you know, resistance training, weight training, uh, my kids are not going to grow. Um, so there's, uh, I, I think there's a lot to be learned about that yeah. for sure. I mean, that's one thing I think I've always noticed with my. So my domain is very different because I do mostly just athletes, and they're already in a sport. So probably mm-hmm. parents are a bit more well aware yes. that all right, this is supplemental work. Absolutely. But I think the general population and the kids who just want to be better at what they're doing at a school level, mm-hmm. uh, parents then become a bit more skeptical with uh, what can happen when you do strength training. 100%, yeah. But just <clears throat> moving on slightly, the main aim for this uh, Ramadan series was to help the youth, the athletes in our community better understand from a very different perspective, from a local perspective, how they can approach it and they think that Ramadan will hamper their growth in terms of their training. It might uh, cause a roadblock because obviously they're not eating properly, not taking enough protein, whatever their goals are. Just from a professional opinion, does Ramadan actually hamper growth when it comes to muscles? Or recovery or maintenance what do you think is the priority when it comes to it I think that um, it definitely makes things a little bit more challenging yeah. 
but the way that you execute things with your training and your nutrition, you can definitely still, you know, at least, um, you know, maintain your progress or even make a little bit of progress in the strength department. Yeah. Um, so, of course, it's, it's a lot more difficult. You're not eating and drinking water for a large period of time. But even now, um, the, the feeding window, once we open fast after iftar, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit longer than in years past, right? So in the last five, yeah. six, seven years, uh, the, the, the evening, the nighttime window was a lot smaller it was, yeah. but even this year I'm noticing we have a lot of time so I can even get you know two even three meals in mm -hmm. um, so you could still consume the same amount of calories that you you would consume in a, in a regular day yeah. um, so it can still be done you just have to focus on of course getting in enough hydration enough water yeah. in, in your feeding window um, enough calories enough protein right that's a big thing and so uh, a lot of you know people might think that I'm gonna lose all my muscle during Ramadan mm -hmm. right you can still get your protein intake in the, in the feeding window and you'll still be able to maintain all your muscle. Um, and depending on what time you train, um, That's true, yeah. yeah, depending on if it's after you open your fast or uh, right before Sahur, I guess, even like the, the first meal that you have in the morning there, um, you could just definitely still make some gains. Yeah, you've given me a lot of branches to explore over here. Let's just talk about the hydration part of it because I think uh, uh, in pursuit of uh, getting those calories in, mm -hmm. They, people tend to lower the amount of water or uh, liquid, fluid, yeah. they, they intake. Yeah. How do you solve that issue or how can we battle that? Yeah, that's, that's a tough one because when you drink a lot of water, you do kind of, exactly. kind of feel full, yeah. right? In, in years past, I had that same issue as well. I made that same mistake of not drinking enough water yeah. and uh, just eating a lot of food, trying to maintain my weight, yeah. um, not even eating vegetables and just trying to you know get my carbs and, and protein in and things like that yeah. but yeah it's, it's just that balance man you got to find that balance between getting in your hydration and still consuming enough calories uh, I, I feel like supplementing with some electrolytes helps me a lot okay. um, so in years past I wouldn't do that but in the last few years I've been supplementing with some electrolytes and I feel like that helps me uh, maintain my hydration throughout the day as well so well when do you think is a good time to take those electrolytes um, I take them at uh, that final meal right before Fajr so, that's okay, right. so I take that that kind of helps me sustain throughout the day. So do you plan on, do you take it before you eat or after you eat? Uh, just during, even. Oh, so during just put it in my water. Okay, so just sip it through? Yeah, just sip it through. Uh, and even, even throughout the evening, you can just kind of sip on it throughout the evening or if you feel hydrated uh, when you open your fast, um, then, you know, we can have some with the, you know, with the first meal after when you open your fast. How much uh, electrolyte is actually good for you to sip throughout that window of eating? And what's the proportion of it to water that you should be taking? So how much water you should be or how much electrolytes? It just kind of depends, I guess, on, on what supplement you take. I usually just like read the recommended label. So if they say like one scoop or, or two scoops or something like that, I'll just, I'll just start with that. And do you take it on a daily basis? Um, definitely while I'm fasting, for sure. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah, definitely right. while I'm fasting and even throughout the year, definitely. All right. So, um, and uh, when it comes to the, so I'm just going to segue over here to the protein aspect because what you've told us is very clear mm -hmm. that it is all very individual. Yeah. People have to listen to their body as well. Uh, obviously, if drinking too much water is going to bloat you and it's going to leave you, uh, I mean, you're not going to eat enough that you should be eating yeah. and vice versa. Same thing, so it's a very fine balance that you need to take care of. Just to, uh, as an example, I am an, uh, a 15 year old soccer athlete. Mm -hmm. I have to do my team training during the day. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to miss my fast. Mm -hmm. What is the best strategy for me f to make sure that I am still performing decent okay. and I'm not losing out on whatever I have gained in terms of my performance? Because I don't, there's no way I'm skipping out of my fast. Okay. I'm, training in the morning, I'm doing gym session uh, after that, I'm in a regimented program, how do I tackle around this? So just trying to just maintain your, 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 your yeah. performance, yeah, your strength yeah. Yeah. and things like that. Um, so if you have the ability to like choose your workout times and if strength and uh, you know power and, and all these the performance aspect is really important, then you should probably schedule your workout maybe right after opening your fast okay. or even um, the last, like, uh, or I guess uh, it's kind of not ideal, but like right before eating sahur, okay. right? So those are the times that, because then you can have food, you can hydrate yourself during your workouts um, and uh, help your performance during your workouts. But if it's something like the 15-year-old the who has 
a, a like a set soccer practice in the middle of the day. There's mm-hmm. not much you can do about that okay. for your training because that's when your training is. So you would be training at a time where you are a little bit malnourished, a little bit you know dehydrated, and yeah. haven't eaten for a long time. Um, but then you would just have to really ensure that uh, when the time comes to uh, eat during the evenings, yeah. then you are getting the proper fuel in your body. So. What would be the breakdown of macros for someone like that? When let's say with a heavy demand, physical demand, while also yeah. fasting, what would be the macro break- breakdown? Um, so there's, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can kind just, of just break down the percentages. Macros, just for those, is your proteins, your carbohydrates, and your fats. These are your macronutrients. Sorry. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So th- yeah, those are the main macronutrients, proteins, uh, carbs, and fats. Each one of them have a different responsibility. Yeah. So when it comes to protein, um, that's your, your building block, right? Your muscle mm-hmm. building block um, that's going to help, help you maintain and build your muscle. Mm-hmm. So, you, and, uh, you know, it kind of varies, but um, the, I guess, rule of thumb is one gram per pound of body weight. That's what you at least aim for, or 80% of that at least. Um, so that's how you're going to maintain and continue to build muscle. So that could end up looking like about 30% of your uh, macronutrient ratio. Okay. So 30% of your calories could come from uh, protein um, or 25 you know somewhere around there okay. um, a lot of people will go with about 40 percent of carbs but again these numbers vary oh, for some, depending on your output absolutely mm-hmm. yeah so um, we, we just broke down um, the proteins carbs and fats as your three macronutrients you we can go into something else like uh, your body type ectomorphs mm-hmm. uh, mesomorph and endomorphs yeah. so for someone like me who is an ectomorph right tall lean um, hard to gain weight I might bump up my carb percentage a little bit because I respond better to that. So it might be above 40%, it might be 45, 50% of my diet. Whereas someone else who might be maybe a little bit shorter, a little bit stockier, they might benefit from having a little bit less carbs, maybe a little bit more fats Mm -hmm. and things like that. But yeah, general rule of thumb could be 30% protein, 40% carbs, and the the final 30% for your fats. So now this was like the... Uh, an athlete breakdown and let's talk about yeah. and that is a very small percentage of the people we are trying to get this information out to yeah. now let's talk about the regular day to day male or female let's say works or does not work depending on the lifestyle they live they always have this misconception that carbohydrates are not good for you mm-hmm. or fats are not good for you yeah. just simplify it for them and tell them is that the case or not no, absolutely not. Th- those three macronutrients, each one of them has a responsibility. Um, carbs are our body's preferred fuel source, so we definitely need carbohydrates, even for our brain function and things like that. Um, I guess you can go further into like what type of carbs okay. and how much carbs and things like that. So, of course, if we're over-consuming carbohydrates, like it's not that 40%, maybe 80% of our diet is carbohydrates, then we're going to run into those problems, right? Okay. But as long as we're having an adequate amount and then we're balancing it out with the protein and fats, then carbs are not the problem, right? Mm-hmm. So definitely eat your carbohydrates. And then you can get into uh, complex carbohydrates um, and the simple carbs. So of mm-hmm. course, uh, you know, donuts and, and pastries and things like that, as opposed to um, oats and potatoes and fruits and things like that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. You know, uh, it's a funny thing, usually, <clears throat> Because I've been in this industry for a while as well, I come across a lot of people who are like, all right, they're just charging money to tell you what to eat. You can just eat everything in moderation. Yeah. But when it comes to, it's so individual, right? That Absolutely, you yeah. you do need coaching at times to help you with, with your timing of the nutrient and what sort of nutrient you're supposed to be taking. Am Absolutely. I right? Absolutely. Everyone's a little bit different. Everyone responds to foods differently too. Um, even just gut health, right? Some Absolutely. people have a certain... You know this or that and they their, their tummy doesn't respond very well to yeah. it so it is pretty you know individualized for sure <clears throat> so the regular uh, person who is in ramadan right now mm-hmm. when you talk about just ideal uh, fueling system yeah. i would say works out two ten twice a week uh what in ramadan what you think would be the preferred timing of nutrient intake so let's say how much what ratio should be the protein on it during iftar at dinner, at suhoor, carbohydrates, fats, if just on the top of your head. No, absolutely. It all depends. So for, for someone like me, um, I, I eat, you know, after iftar. And then a couple hours later, I'll try to get in another meal or snack. 
and then of course you know you wake up before Fajr and you have Sahur then you get so I get that third meal in yeah. whereas someone else they might not be able to eat that much they might have one meal and you know snack on a couple of things and then they might have the one more meal at Sahur mm-hmm. um, so I would say at any meal though I would definitely make a make it a point to get protein in right how so, much protein do you think you you've just for your yeah so in a, in a traditional meal, so like throughout the day, like throughout the year when you're not fasting, mm. you would spread your protein intake throughout the day. So, yeah. you know, you could consume maybe three meals or four or five times a day. Um, and each meal you could get about, you know, 25, 30, 40 grams of protein at each sitting. Okay. But now that we're in Ramadan, <clears throat> if we're not getting all of those meals and we're not hitting our protein goal, then you might be having to force yourself to have more protein at each meal. So it might be up to 50, 60 grams of protein at each meal just to make up for the, uh, the total daily intake that you're aiming for. Okay. Um, so you might have a, a bigger protein meal uh, or bigger meals in general okay. during Ramadan. Um, and same thing with um, your final meal before or, or at Sahur. Um, you might need to have a, a good amount of protein there just to kind of sustain you throughout the day, keep you full. Do, do you think uh, in this situation, especially in Ramadan, that consuming let's say a protein supplement makes your job easier that it's quick absorbing and then it can leave you enough I mean space in your body to consume other macros as well absolutely that would help a lot so yeah something like a protein shake or a protein supplement is a little bit more quick absorbing yeah. so especially for an athlete they can use that to their advantage for sure do you think this advice would help out the general population as well I think so I think so yeah definitely um, maybe not from a performance standpoint but just uh, from an intake standpoint so to get enough protein if somebody's struggling to eat enough protein then definitely a supplement would help for sure do you think there is a i mean there's this fad that has been going on for a while now it's always within the community because whenever ramadan comes there's always a certain people here and there who think oh this is a good time to lose weight yeah. is that actually real can you actually lose fat in ramadan I, th- I mean, I think it's an ideal time if, okay. if that's the goal uh, from like a, a body composition standpoint or a, or a fitness goal standpoint. If the, the goal is to lose weight, then I mean, what better time than Ramadan? But again, um, some people might even not lose weight or might even gain weight during Ramadan because now they've, they've been fasting all day. So they're over consuming uh, okay. in the nighttime, right? They're over indulging in, in you know, treats and, and, and sweets and just kind of... Um, you know, foods that are, have, are, have a, a, high, a higher caloric intake, right? Yeah. So they're kind of overindulging on that. But if you if you plan it out right, uh, again, you're kind of limiting your caloric intake to where it needs to be, right? You're not overdoing it in the evenings. Then it's an ideal time to lose weight for sure because mm-hmm. you're, you're fasting all day long. How would you uh, structure a, a nutrition program for someone who's actually trying to lose weight? What, what, what would you tell them or some advices? Apart from the caloric intake and uh, output, obviously it's uh, it's an equation. Mm-hmm. But in terms of the quality of the food that they're eating, how can they periodize it or how can they time it? During Ramadan? Specifically? During or, Ramadan, yeah. yeah just, um, so again, the, the feeding window will be in the evening, um, prioritizing protein, drinking lots of water, and yes, again, limiting the foods that are going to be like high in calories and not very satiating, so meaning they're not going to keep you full. So focusing on protein, focusing on complex carbohydrates. What are, what are exa- examples of complex carbs? Let's say complex carbs. Uh, for the, uh, you have a big Desi community here, let's say yeah. for example them. Because obviously every culture has a different uh, uh, preference of uh, food choices. Yeah. Uh, so just sort of try to break it down. There were different options of complex carbs. Absolutely. So complex carbs would be your, your potatoes, your rice, your... Um, uh, sweet potatoes, your beans, lentils, uh, vegetables, and things like that. Oats, okay. fruits, things like that. So, um, growing up in in our culture, in our, our in our uh, household, uh, we would open our fast with a lot of deep fried food, like yeah, some right. uh, yeah, so spring rolls, pakoras, and yeah. spring rolls, and yeah. stuff like that. And that stuff you can just eat and eat and eat, like uh, and never get full. And never get full, yeah, right? Yeah, just keep yeah. it, have a couple more samosas yeah. and things like that. So first and foremost, the first thing you're putting into your tummy after fasting for so long is deep fried food yeah. uh, and again you don't really know you can eat a 
a ton of that without even knowing it, right? So. And the thing is, you also always have a side of ketchup or chutney yeah. with it, and then the you don't realize you end up consuming a lot of that as well. Exactly. You They're really it. high in sugars yeah. and can really spike your insulin then that way. There you go. Now you're running into all these problems, like you said, spiking your insulin and sugars and the calories and all of a sudden in one meal you've eaten more than you should have in the whole day type of thing because you're starving you're hungry you are starving and yeah. you're hungry absolutely uh, another thing that has always uh, sort of crossed my mind because when people ask me when they are like alright I want to still follow my uh, regime of working out the number of times that I actually do in a week okay. and but because of iftar and then I have to rush for tarawih yeah. and then uh, when do I actually squeeze in that time okay. because after I eat something in an hour and a half I have to be in masjid yeah. and it takes me at least 40-45 minutes to digest my food what can I do and then when I come back from tarawih the gyms are closed yeah. now how do you tackle how can we tackle that situation it's tough it's def- definitely tough um, we have to be realistic and keep in mind that like during Ramadan, your again your strength and your energy levels are going to be uh, depleted. Know, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I would even shorten the workouts, right? So uh, kind of lower the volume of your workouts, yeah. right? Lower the intensity of your workouts, um, lower the duration of your workouts. So those type of things are, are things that yeah you probably have to you know you probably have to factor in when you're um, planning your workouts. Yeah. So yeah, maybe just shorter workouts can kind of help. Can I squeeze them in before Tarawi and things like that? When I used to, uh, I mean, a couple of my athletes' parents came up to me and then they were like, what can I do? Mm-hmm. I basically just told them very clearly, look, the 15 minutes that you have before you leave for the masjid mm-hmm. and uh, just before that, I would say grab a chair, just do like 50 up and down on the chair, like a yeah. squat. Yeah, there you go. Just sit down if you can, do push-ups if you can. Yeah. If your body allows it, do it. Otherwise, get on your knees and do it. Yeah. But staying active or increasing the number of steps that you take is a decent enough workout to Absolutely. maintain your activity level in Ramadan? Absolutely. I think so, yeah. Just uh, keep it simple. Keep it simple. Um, and maybe Ramadan is not the month to set PRs and exactly. go super it's heavy. It is. Maybe it's not that month. I right? mean, sure, the so goal is to set a PR with uh, spirituality. <laughs> yes. But in go. terms of uh, body gains, I think it can take a back seat for some people, right? I mean, it's hard. there's nothing wrong in it. Yeah, absolutely. That can be the month where you recover a little bit more, where you, again, do a little bit more maintenance work, where you do a lot, a lot of mobility work. So True, I, yeah, I focus yeah. a lot on mobility As during Ramadan because yeah. you can do that throughout the day too. You can sit you down, can, you can yeah. work on your hips, you can work on your back and things like that. And it's not very taxing. It's yeah. not like you're running or lifting heavy weights and things like that. So I, I would like, again, rewire your, your training and your um, goals to be a little bit more maybe mobility work or working on your weaker links or the smaller muscle groups. Um, so kind of use Ramadan to do the things that you kind of put off for uh, you know majority of the year right so I, I, I do think that people also put uh, unrealistic expectations on themselves to try to maintain a certain level of lifestyle in Ramadan mm-hmm. forgetting the purpose of Ramadan exactly. which we already know but still try to then they beat themselves up and then probably get into that habit of alright okay we lose everything once we are back uh, post Ramadan so let's just do whatever we want to do and throughout the year you should be cycling things anyways when you're yeah. per- periodization and things like yeah. that so yeah there are going to be certain months where you're going really hard maybe you're doing a, an intense strength program maybe save that up for the month right before Ramadan mm. and there should be um, other months throughout the year where you're kind of in a lower phase more, more of a maintenance phase or a uh, um, yeah, just kind of a recovery phase and things like that. So maybe that's the maybe the Ramadan is a good time to do that, and again shift your focus a little bit more to the spiritual spiritual side of things. Because no, no, yeah, the, the way I, the way I see Ramadan, Ramadan is training as it well. Is training, it, is yeah, training. it is training. You're just maybe not necessarily focusing on the physical aspect so much, right? You're training your your mind and your faith and things like that. So okay. it should be a month where you go hard on that right? and, and you focus on that. Do you uh, in uh, in terms of intensity? It also depends on the person in Ramadan or can you put in a blanket statement saying that I, you can everyone, no matter what you, who you are, yeah. as long as you're not a professional, okay. can actually reduce the intensity or you would tell them change it according to how you feel? So it, it depends. Um, so for me, myself, like even if I'm fasting all day long, 17, 18 hours a day, and if I work out right before Maghrib and I, I can go pretty hard and I can still get in a good workout and I'm still able to 
lift almost as much as I normally would okay. or even play soccer and run around and things like that. Whereas, um, for example, like, uh, not putting him on his wife, but my brother, for example, um, he fades a lot quicker throughout the workout. Okay. So he, he can get really strong really quick. Mm. But if he works out at the end of the day, his workout will not go well. Oh, okay. he'll, he'll, halfway through, he'll, he'll need something, he might low, low blood sugar or something like that, getting dizzy and whatnot. Mm. So, yeah, it kind of does vary uh, person to person. So some people, they can work out fasted, um, even throughout the year. A lot of my clients will show up to their morning session and they haven't had breakfast yet, and they do fine. And there's another client who showed up without breakfast in the morning and halfway through the workout they're laying on the ground because they're dizzy so mm. it's, it depends yeah so i mean uh so just to uh, sort of summarize it so from whatever i've understood and over the years and what you're saying mm. there are a few times where you can actually up the intensity depending on so let's say before suhoor is one time that you can really go all out yeah probably because you can fuel yourself better afterwards and, and you've been eating for the last few hours or so, right? So you're, you feel good. You feel good. Yeah. Do you think you can uh, train high intensity even after your suhoor? Yes. No? You yeah. can? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So okay. that's another good time too. So yeah, before suhoor is good because again, you've been eating and you can hydrate and yourself throughout the workout. But it's such a weird time. It's such it an awkward right. time. It it's is, like yeah. three in the morning or something like that. Yeah. So yeah, depending on your schedule and things like that, that might not work. Um, or some people might be able to make that work. Yeah. But yeah, right after Suhoor, early in the morning, you still have, like you just ate, so you still have some energy, even a couple hours afterwards. Yeah. So you could execute the workout. Okay. And then still have a lot of strength, still be able to uh, perform well. That's, yeah. I, but the thing is now, the rest of the, the day, you're not having water and things like that, so true. that can be challenging. True. And then uh, intensity-wise, do you think, let's say people who break their fast, mm -hmm. pray, head to the gym, mm -hmm. do their workout, come back and then have that meal. Yeah. Do you think that's an ideal situation or ideal strategy? Probably the most ideal time. But then the thing is with uh, with Tarawi and things like that. So now you get into that cutting problem. Too close, yeah. They're cutting you too close. So if you have time, <clears throat> that would probably be your ideal time. Okay. But now there's, again, there's so many moving parts. So will, will you be able to make it to Tarawi and things like that or, or whatnot, right? So you have to factor all, <laughs> the, all of that in. Yeah. But that would be the ideal time, probably. Yeah, a lot of uh, with the disinformation, misinformation out there. Do you think that uh, less knowledge is dangerous when it comes to these things? That people are just throwing everything out there, or don't worry about it. You can go heavy this, heavy that. Yeah. Do you think people are losing the plot sometimes? I think so. Yeah, maybe maybe everyone's an expert nowadays, right? Everyone can just go and and, and say things, right? So there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of information out there, so you just have to kind of filter through and see, you know, what's 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 good and what's not, right? Let's say you, I for for a very long time, I was one of the only ones in my family who used to be sort of, you know, how people say health conscious. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to really take care of myself. Try to do now still, but then when I was living with parents, I would a few years ago, uh, they had a different iftar okay. getting made for them. Yeah. I used to have my, no, I can't have that iftar, yeah. I'm going to have my dinner at this time. Oh, and, the yeah, so because <laughs> in the house you had two different meals going in. Yeah. Do you think uh, it's easy or it's not? Let's say if you put yourself or, or for people who, for kids, let's say teenagers, what can they do when they have, they want to live a certain lifestyle? Yeah. But their parents are uh, eating something that they are used accustomed to yeah how do you tackle that situation what would your advice be to them that's a that's a difficult one because i went through that myself for sure really? same thing as you yeah, yeah, just uh, having a different meal oh yeah my parents are enjoying the pakoras <laughs> while here i'm here even, uh, even i'm eating slightly healthier than them but yeah. i'm eating my dinner with say i don't want to generalize it and say chicken and rice it wasn't yeah. that bland okay. it was a bit more flavorful <laughs> like but that. but yeah i mean it's uh, two different worlds on the dining table yeah absolutely um yeah, and even just carrying like I, you know, I carry out carry around my water bottle all throughout the day, I everywhere I go and stuff like that. And then family would be like, "What the heck are you doing? You don't need to carry your water and things like that." So it is definitely tough. Um, you you mean like tough uh, on how the child they, to yeah be, yeah how could they equip themselves okay to even live that lifestyle while their parents are also doing what they're doing? You mean difficult like from the parents like kind of making them feel a certain way, or do you mean like Both. the child? getting tempted to be like oh me i can't stick with this which way both 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 yes yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely tough if you don't have a, a supporting cast around you that helps you 
uh, you know, towards your goals and things like that. It's always tough. Right? It's always going to be tough if your parents or your family or your friends uh, make you feel a certain way. Yeah. Then uh, you just you know. Do, do you cook? I do. Yeah. Do, do you think cooking now is a is a skill or is it a necessity? Um, skill or a necessity. I mean, it's always it's always a good skill to have. You always okay. definitely want to be able to cook. Nowadays, I'm not sure if it's a necessity because you have all of these. Uh, what is it? The apps and stuff where you can uh, kind of order the food and it kind of shows up right at your door. So mm -hmm. a lot of people are doing that now, or a meal prep company and things like that. Um, but I, I always think uh, cooking is very important. It's always mm -hmm. a, it's a good skill to have, and it's uh it's always good to know how to make your own food. I always uh, tell my athletes that if your parents are living a certain type of lifestyle, they're eating something that they want, and obviously they're not joining you in the pursuit. Mm -hmm. Learn to cook and yeah. make it yourself. That's exactly what happened with me. That's why I had to learn how to cook. That's I, had to, it. I had to do it, right? I, I, I do not like this mindset right now with a lot of youngsters that I've come across. Is uh, now I can't speak because that's the general population I deal with. Now, uh, you would probably tell me your side of it. But most of my athletes are like cooking. No, man, I can't. No, it's too yeah. tough. Oh, no. I'm like, what are you talking that's about? That's what it's going to take. That's what it's going to take to learn. Right, that's how you take matters into your own hands, right? If uh, if if the goal is really that important to you, yeah, right? that's true. So you you definitely you take matters into your own hands. You ask your parents to teach you how to cook, right? Or yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> the question also comes in like uh, I mean, obviously it's a very uh, generic uh, statement to put, and obviously I could be wrong in it, but the majority is men uh, or boys are not too fond of cooking. Mm -hmm. Because of this stereotype that we don't cook, yeah, <laughs> uh, which is absolutely ridiculous. Because I believe that uh, cooking is a is a necessity. Absolutely. It's a life skill Big time. that you need to learn because you have to travel someday or somewhere. You'll be living alone, and you need to do it. Absolutely, in my my opinion, a very important life skill for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For the uh, sort of, uh, I just wanted to touch on vegetarians as well because we do have a few people in our community who are vegetarians. Mm -hmm by choice or out of uh, some other necessity uh, when you talk about protein intake for them it's a very hotly debated topic of they have very few options to get their protein in yeah. what can they do or what can they implement in their nutrition yeah. to complete that quota of protein yeah it, it definitely is tougher for vegetarians yeah. because you're you're, you know, you're cutting out uh, a lot of your main protein sources. Not to say that there aren't any vegetarian uh, protein sources. I mean, there are vegetarian bodybuilders out there who are just jacked, right? Who, yeah. who get their protein in through, through vegetarian sources. So I guess you just really got to do your uh, research and find the, uh, the best vegetarian, uh, vegetarian sources of protein, right? Your, uh, your, your, your beans, your lentils, your edamame beans, uh, uh, chickpeas, uh, you know, tofu, tempeh, and then you can supplement with a, a, a vegan protein source and things like that, like a protein powder or whatnot. Yeah. So yeah, you just you have to kind of make it an effort and uh, kind of go out of your way to really make sure that you're getting in that protein intake. And it can be done. It can be done? Absolutely. Do you think it's harder for, I mean, this one thing also, is it harder for vegetarians to actually put on muscle? Is that a myth or is that true? Um, it's, yeah, so, so, same thing I was saying earlier, it's, it's definitely harder, like you have to really do the research. You can't just be eating kind of any vegetarian food and, and Think that's gonna happen so you have to kind of go out of your way to make sure you're you're getting in what you need to get in so mm. which you're getting in your vegetarian sources of protein now I just wanted to uh, sort of again I'm just uh, jumping all over the place no, there's so fine. much to talk about yeah oh no I'm having a blast I mean, it's, a, it's a rabbit hole right once yeah. you get down there you just go keep going deeper and deeper absolutely I want to try to touch on every uh, generation of our community like so we've touched on the teenage athlete we've touched on the 20 year olds let's say who are at home struggling to follow their pursuit of fitness mm -hmm. you have 30 year olds let's say us who are sort of in a family structure then you have the 40s and 50 year olds i want to touch upon those people now okay the slightly who, who graduating into other phases of life yeah the slightly older ones and it breaks down really differently. Men and women can never be put in that category when it comes to the uh, the biology and the physiology and the workouts and the muscle structure. Mm -hmm. For them, the aging uh, category, yeah. what is what are the few things they really have to keep in mind in Ramadan yeah. when it comes to their eating habits? When it comes to their eating habits, um, even as 
people are getting older, right? And they're getting their, you know, their whatever, 40s and 50s and whatnot. Um, all the same things apply, right? Like they still need to maintain their health, maintain their fitness level, maintain their muscle and things like that. Um, every year that we get older, after a certain age, whatever that may be, 30, 35, whatever, um, we do start to lose muscle. Mm-hmm. We do to start to lose uh, you know, bone density and things like that. So it is very important that as we age, we continue to do some strength training. We continue to you know, do a little bit of maybe low level plyometrics. We continue to get enough protein. We continue to eat healthy and things like that. So, I mean, in Ramadan specifically, all the same things would apply. Maybe mm-hmm. not training and working out and sneaking in workouts, uh, you know, after that and things like that. So that might be a little bit extreme or a little bit much for some people who are getting older. Um, but the same thing you said, even just, you know, walking more, get, taking care of your health, eating the right foods, eating the right amounts and things like that. I think all the same principles can apply. Is it is it safe to say that once someone in their teens and 20s, even if they skip or do not get enough protein, mm-hmm. they're still fine with it. But then the older generation have to place a bit more emphasis on their protein intake because of the declining muscle mass in their body. Absolutely. I think so. Yeah, I think so. so. Definitely. Yeah. Prioritizing those things, making sure you're getting enough protein and whatnot. I know we're talking a lot about protein today, but... Just but, I mean, but it's such an important it part is. of really uh, is, yeah. biology that you can't even overlook it for a second. Absolutely. And I, and, and I notice when we start with our clients and we, we do an analysis of their food intake and things like that, majority of people are not getting enough. So majority of people are under consuming protein, right? And it's a it's a big problem for sure. Do you, do you, so I mean it's a, another uh, it's a what's your take on the the quote that I once uh, heard from someone mm. that nowadays we are not obese as much as we are under muscled. Is that actually something yeah. that's true? That that could be definitely a good way I of looking so. at it. Yeah, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. That we're not working out enough. We're not strength training enough. We're not taking enough protein in. We're mm. too too uh, focused on the carbohydrates and then fats and then oily stuff. Forget about oily stuff as well. I mean, yeah. do you think we're just too set in our ways to realize that the population is suffering? Yeah, I think so. I think that's a good way to look at it. Under muscled is yeah. a, it could be a way to definitely look at it. Yeah. So I know that whatever we're talking about goes beyond the realm of Ramadan as well, obviously, yeah. because our main aim was Ramadan and yes. you've covered a lot of aspects because at the end of the day, uh, guys, Ramadan is such a personal journey. Everyone's goals are so different. You can derive something from Ramadan, which you probably do not want to derive. There's something, obviously. <laughs> Spiritual wise, I think we're all on the same page. But in terms of physical, how you want to be, what you want to be, my aim... <clears throat> On a personal level, was never to uh, grow muscle. It was more about maintaining it. Okay. So I made sure that my daily activities were covered. I was uh, mildly active, not overly active. My job is such that I'm very active anyway. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah, can't you, <laughs> you can't do anything. You can't do anything about absolutely, it. Absolutely. Yeah. But I would say, don't sit on your backside all day. Get up. Uh, I don't. I don't want to uh, sound very preachy over here. But if you look at our history, we have had. A lot of uh, accomplishments done by a lot of people in Ramadan while they were fasting. Absolutely. So I think it's not, uh, you know, we can't say that it's hard now. Mm-hmm. It is what it is. It is a practice that we have it in our culture, in our religion, and it's important. But yes, do put your best foot forward to make sure that your health is fine. You're making sure that you are not losing track of what Ramadan is all about in Absolutely. this pursuit of conversation. And I think the, the Ramadan, if I'm not mistaken, is the month that the Quran was revealed, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a very yeah, big month. It's a monumental that, month. That's a huge month. So yeah. make sure that you have your spiritual in, uh, um, uh, intact. But remember, if you're physically fit, you can do much better in this month. Because last 10 nights, you've got to make sure you, those who practice trying to find the Laylatul Qadr, you have to stand for hours. Yeah. And that comes with practice. Yeah. So that comes with practice. Praying the mass, getting down. Uh, your mobility and stuff it like that. Mobility. You want to be able to. It is your mobility yeah, work. Play all the records and stuff. So. Uh, I mean, uh, what I'm about to ask you does not have to do much with uh, Ramadan as such. Okay. But it's just the aspect of training. I just wanted to explore that area with you. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is one thing because obviously domains are different, and I can very clearly say from my end that yes, but. I do feel that there's less Muslim representation when it comes to elite athletes. That's I can say that for a fact, in especially in the youth sector. Yeah. Do you think you who deals a lot more with the general population, yeah. 
Do you think that's uh, true as well? I think so. You think, think so? so? I think so. Yeah, I think there's maybe, maybe uh, you know, the health and fitness world is not uh, a field or an area where a lot of Muslim uh, maybe parents will think is a route that is, is possible, a route that their kids should go, and things like that. So yeah, maybe there is a, a lack of representation in that field. Why do you, is that lack of education or is that what is it? Maybe I don't know. That's a that's a that's a tough point. Maybe a lack. So because of, this has always uh, baffled me. Even I don't have an answer for it. So I try to yeah. seek out from people in the industry to see is there a trend? Maybe the lack of believing that that is a like I I know for me for example when I'm uh, when I was in school for engineering yeah. before uh, before anything health and fitness related in my in my career, but I was in school for engineering so. When I was switching over to personal training, I know there was a day. Oh, what, are you, what are you doing, man? How could you? What, that, that's the, what are you gonna do with that? Or there's no, there's no uh, future there, or there's no, you know, possibilities there. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's something to do with that. But they think that maybe there's no possibility, or it's not as important, or uh, yeah, something like that. Why? Why is it that parents are okay with uh, the kid playing a sport, but not okay with them going to the gym and working out? That's always that's always uh, <laughs> yeah. that's always put me on edge. I'm like, why? Yeah. My, my, my family got. And then he's going to the gym again. What are you going? Exactly. <laughs> why are you going to the gym go? again? Did you, did you just, you just go yesterday. Go? Like, you know, so when when the first time that I actually bought like, so you know, when you were young, you the first thing that you ever buy or think of buying or uh, have the courage to go up to your parents and tell them I want to buy. It. A protein powder. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh no, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, there's a steroids. Steroids in there. No. What are you doing? You're eating dumbbells. What is this? Steroids. You're yeah, so you're going to get fat. You're doing it. Don't, don't eat that. Don't consume that. And man, it's, uh, and you know, it's, uh, it's weird that 15 years later, that's yeah. still the case. I think so, yeah. Right? I mean, what case. happened? Like, <laughs> our generation are becoming parents and why do we hold this sort of thinking? I don't know. I mean, it's the lack of understanding or lack of uh, education in that in that field, I guess. I know, man. This is yeah. way beyond Ramadan, but this is always something that I always wanted to discuss with someone and be like, is there something we can do from the ground level? So my, uh, just to uh, put it out there and uh, just to let you know, I'm also the uh, Vice President of Sports of uh, BCMA now. And Congratulations. Thank you so That's much. Uh, the only reason I'm putting out there is because I, f I felt the need and I saw that we don't have enough athlete representation, elite athlete representation from uh, from the Muslim community. So I'm trying to establish a, a, a speed and explosive and elite athlete training program in a few masjids over here nice. in uh, Lower Mainland. That's amazing. Because I do think that uh, we need to sort of push our community mm -hmm. into those domains and and uh, aspects of pla and places where they can actually be good because our religion is all about excellence yeah. and we sometimes uh, do not aim for excellence and we are happy with mediocrity yeah. and I do think that uh, this reason for this podcast, this Ramadan series is also bring in Muslim entrepreneurs who are actually trying to help people so reach out to them, uh, they will help you out uh, you will benefit from them and our main aim at the end of the day is to make sure that our community thrives in an environment where we are a minority and it's always important for us to stay together and help each other out and this was one of the reasons I had to start the podcast and I'm really happy that you came here for this. No, well. Thank you for having me man, I, re I really appreciate you inviting me onto no, your no, podcast no, for sure. Of course, of course. Uh, so, you another thing that apart from Ramadan, when it comes to the training aspect of it, because the conversation is flowing really nice and I don't want to, just because we stopped talking about Ramadan, we don't want to miss out on another few important things we can learn from you. How important is does plyometric training get when you get older? Because you mentioned this thing right now when you when you spoke about the aging population, okay. there has to be some level of resistance training, some level of plyometrics. Yes. Why is plyometrics so important when you get older? I think that, and this is what so I... So I'm sorry Rafi, can you just oh. tell them what plyometrics is? Oh, plyometric training as opposed to your traditional strength training where you're, you're lifting weights, maybe a lot slower tempo and things like that. The plyometrics would be more jumping and, and hopping and, and it's a little bit more of your fast, uh, fast twitch muscle fibers and things like that, right? Skipping and jumping on boxes and agility work and things like that. So mm -hmm. that's what plyometric training is. Um, I think that after a certain age, so when we're younger, we'll, we'll play in sports, we'll play soccer or we'll jump around you know parks and things like that but as we get older after a certain age maybe we get our 
we go to school or we get a job that's like you know sitting at the desk now we don't do any of that so we do lose a lot of our ability to do so so we'll lose our strength we'll lose our muscle we'll lose our flexibility but we'll also lose our ability to jump and hop and, and move around and things like that so that's why it is important to continue to do plyometrics as we get older um, so we don't lose you know all of that ability you know there's a uh, uh we, this is a very good conversation and honestly I don't want it to end because we can derive a lot from this but obviously good things do come to an end but just one thing that just popped into my head okay. do you think that in old age the breaking of hip the femurs the ugly falls can all be sort of reduced if you follow a decent regimented strength and conditioning program 1000% Awesome, right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think that's a good enough reason for people to even, and is it ever too late to start working out? No, absolutely. Our oldest client at the gym right now is 85. Wow. 85 years old. He comes in, he works on his legs, he works on his balance and things like that. Um, because yeah, another thing is as we get older, I was talking about all of the things that we lose and all things that diminish as we get older, but the chances of us falling are a lot higher and the chances of us recovering from that fall are a lot less. So yeah, we can try our best to continue to work on our balance and our strength and our bone density and things like that. And uh, that will help us with things like falling and we're aging, right? Yeah, that's good. All right, Pavis, the last segment of this podcast, I'm gonna, there's a rapid fire thing. I'm going to ask you just a few <laughs> questions, very basic ones, just okay. to better understand what sort of a personality you are. Okay. So <laughs> but just a few, whatever comes into your mind first, just say it. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite body part to work on? <sighs> favorite body part to work on? I like to train everything. I like to train anything. I know that's, that's a very cliche answer. That's a very political let's say, answer. Let's say chest. Chest. Yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, what is it about the chest thing? Is it the bench press that really uh, makes I, it fun for you? When I first started working out, like day one, I couldn't do a single push up. Yeah. And uh, when I went to the bench press for the very first time, my brother was spotting me. The bar came down, and I couldn't get the bar up. So yeah. I think there's like a bit of chip on my shoulder. You know, like right. every time I train chest, I'm like, all right, let's go. It's a uh, you know uh, what also makes me crazy is when athletes love doing bench press but cannot do a proper push up properly. Yeah, absolutely. I, that just that's that's a pet peeve of mine. I can't you see. Start with the fundamentals. How, how can you not push-up. do push ups first, yeah. perfect it, and then move on to bench press? Yeah, I never get it. Well, your go to meals. Go to meal. Like yeah, just during Ramadan yeah. specifically. it doesn't matter whenever. I mean, for me, it's eggs. Just get a bunch of eggs, fry them, oatmeal. Uh, throw some throw some banana in the oatmeal, some peanut butter, and there you go. That's your go to meal. Go to meal. What do you usually cook your eggs in? Uh, olive oil usually. Olive oil, olive oil or usually. Um, um, avocado oil, something like that. Right. Another some thing. Ghee is not bad for you. Butter is not bad for you. But if you can eliminate those silly oils out there, yeah. the canola oils, sunflower oils, I think am I am I saying the right thing? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You can you can spare them. Yeah. Stick to healthy alternatives: butter, ghee, olive oil, avocado oil, even coconut oil in coconut some oil, cases. Yeah, yeah, they're good. Well, they're good uh, choices, right? For sure. Uh, your go-to drink. Go-to drink. Water. I like ice cream water. Simply, yeah. yeah. Simple. Uh, coconut water. You, Nothing better than yeah. coconut water. <laughs> Nothing better than coconut water. Your favorite cuisine? Favorite cuisine? I, I, again, cliche answer is like I, I eat anything, but uh, I really like Italian food. What's uh, in Italian that you like? I what's like pizza, man. Pizza's pizza? my go-to. Yeah. What's your What's your favorite topping on the pizza? Uh, again, super boring. The, I, I guess what we're realizing is I'm a very boring individual, but uh, cheese pizza. I like cheese pizza. It's just but like plain margarita pizza. Plain, simple cheese pizza is awesome. But uh, yeah, any type of pizza, vegetarian, you know. Whatever, you know, what, the fact that you said that you're a very boring person, I'll tell you one thing yeah. that I've uh, it's good to be boring, I think. Simple, the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the more you have a routine, yeah. the more you like, you know, for a fact what you like and you want to stick to it. Yeah, I think that's healthy, absolutely. I I'm don't very, think that's it, might be boring to the outside people, but yeah. I think it's the best thing ever. I'm very simple, very boring. Uh, I'm a creature of habit, so I definitely have that routine that I like to stick to for a long period of time. Yeah. But I feel like that's the that's you know that's kind of what's going to inch you forward and continue to help you move forward, right? Is you gotta just keep going. Yeah. So. Favorite meal to cook. Favorite meal to. Favorite cook. If you see all my questions around food, because <laughs> I love food. Yeah. I love food. Favorite meal to cook. Um, I'm pretty good at making pasta, like Alfredo. You know? Alfredo, yeah. It's a, what's your favorite type of pasta? Now we're going uh, into the nuances. I like Alfredo. I like, you like, know? Yeah. So you like the spaghetti or fettuccine? What do you usually Oh, favorite eat? type of pasta. Uh, yeah, fettuccine. 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 Cool, yeah. Right. Your favorite source of protein? 
Favorite source of protein? The top three. Uh, eggs, chicken, salmon. Ah, that's very good. Yeah. All right, Pervez, thank you so much for uh, gracing us with your presence. Thank you so much. For and if you would like us to have a bit, because there are a lot of things that we can really go into, and because it's a very nuanced conversation to have, the lot of depths and edges and nooks and crannies we can go into to really simplify fitness and nutrition for you. If you would like it, do write it in the comments. And Pervez, thank you so much, okay. and I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much for having yeah. me. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah.